How's it going? <laughs> good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Good to see you. We're good. We got it. We got it. You made it work. I got to tell you right off the top, I don't really, uh, you've called me drunk like three times now. It's 11 o'clock. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm alive. Alive well, you, and well. Close the curtains and the light won't blow out the shot. Okay. And throw that cat out the window from the second balcony. Pardon? Can you throw your cat out the window? No. <laughs> I'm moving him. No, she's fine. Just you need to make uh, the, the, the curtains dark. Yeah, I don't know how to fucking do that. Okay, that's all right. Just turn the camera to the left about an inch. Good? That's way better. That's better. Now uh, the light. Cool. I'm new to the shit, you know? Hey, I'm trying. And good for you for trying. A lot of guys, look, you know, COVID. It, we were doing shows in a field last year. Baseball field. Like right, right next to a baseball field in you know, a park, man. With an so, ice cream uh, truck. Remember yeah. the ice cream truck? <laughs> that was an ice cream truck. And pop showing up, you know? I know. It was amazing. It was uh, to see that kind of attention just from a field. It was it was kind of hippie stuff. Like it was kind of Woodstocky. Yeah. Uh, look, what do you guys pro? You know, we just want to tell some dick jokes next to some dog shit. You know, we just want to make people laugh. You know, that's all we want to do: make people laugh and happy. And not only that, like you made a lot of people get through a rough time during the summer by bringing them the funny, where I drove a lot of people to suicide and broke up relationships. You remember the posts of people freaking out? Oh, man. <laughs> people can't handle you, Jason. People can't handle, <laughs> handle the madness that is Jason Rouse, you know? Yeah, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty but, fun to see where, how that, because that was the first time. Look, you can't take a wild animal that, that lives in a, a, in a zoo yeah. and then let him out in the field with the deer. Yeah. The comedy club was the building that harnessed it. The microphone is the anchor, and the, this is right. the, and it holds me to, to this. Yeah. <coughs> right? right. Uh. Well, like, yeah. Well, I also like to fact one audience on like you, you go full steam. Like, yeah, you don't give a fuck. No, you go at it full hand, and that's like awesome to see as a new comic. And it's something that I put in well, my head. And yeah, how many years have you been doing comedy now? Four, I've been doing it four years, yeah, four years. Because uh, I'd come back, I think I, we'd met, you'd only been doing comedy a couple of years. Yeah. I think maybe I saw you at the corner. Were you hanging around the corner? I, the first time I saw you. Oh, you just at the moved. Ben you just moved. Bank shows. The first time I saw you. Yeah. At the and bank, you just, bank where, shows. where did you move from? I started doing comedy in Winnipeg. Oh, in Winnipeg. I feel sorry for you. Hold on. That a cold fucking city, but honestly, I think comedy's. I think comedy prevails in hard cities. Like, Winnipeg is a pretty tough city to live in, and it's a great comedy scene. And, man, he's like 20 people taking. 20 people or more can come out to, to an open mic. Open mic on a Wednesday night to an open mic. And that taught me how to do the audience. And I just took it and sure. I ran with it, you know? I think that's why the comedians that tour across Canada. You look at first of all, you know, outside of a yuck yucks, it's a fucking bloodbath. Yeah, 
Like you get into these independent cities, these smaller clubs, you're like, we might have to leave right after the show. Rowdy, it's yeah. probably good. It's for our best interest just to get out of here. Right. And, uh, yeah. but because of that, when Canadians end up on American showcases, they really, like, first of all, I had some guys come and stay with me from the West Coast, Brett right. and Walker and uh, Uncle Hack. I know, right? You're already giggling about it because. No, it, Tommy Fear is Sam Walker. Pardon me? He's a Kill Tony famous Sam Walker. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen my Kill Tony, yeah. That, that's when they were here. Yeah. So um, those, for somebody to come out of obscurity almost, out from Canada, from Calgary, to show up in the epicenter of stand-up comedy here in Austin and kick ass, and not only that, a couple of the other guy, or one of the other guys who don't even doing comedy for a number of months. Yeah. And he's, because he'd done so many shitty gigs in Canada, he was like a microphone with an audience. I got it. I feel like gigs, if I can even call with that on Tuesday night, they were like four people in an audience and a, our tender and like they just that's fine have fun let's do this have fun just have fun don't so, take it too i can't take it to i can't take those shows there is i just have fun and see what me, happens move it up. don't yeah. take canadian show business seriously canadian sure. show business is an oxymoron it doesn't exist they're not rooting for you they're not going you know what we should fucking give Jared, his own sitcom on the CBC. He's hilarious. He's got a great story. Blah, blah, blah. Nope. No. no. You know, every 10 years, the CBC will hand out a show to some comedian. I think the last person would probably be Jerry D, who uh, yeah. uh, is one of those few people that had actually had a life in Canadian show business. Yeah. There's really no, there's like five comics that make, like you, there's, there's, a, there's a cap. And, and it's the cap, the top of that pyramid. Look, walk into the CBC and go, yeah, this would be a great place to work in a fucking hospital full of assholes. <laughs> yeah. Why not? What was why that not? Fucking hospital, eh? So get what was that fucking hospital? What's that? It looks like a fucking hospital. Yeah. Where are you walking in? Yeah. Look, at, first of all, you're never going to run into anybody cool in that building unless they're leaving. Right. <laughs> They fired Strombo. That's how right? How are you, anyway, better for yeah. him. Anyway, I'm rambling. You started doing comedy in Vancouver, right? Yeah, actually, June 25th, 1996, I did my first show. So I just celebrated 25 year anniversary. And, of yeah, in what year of doing comedy, they Check it out that doing comedy in Canada isn't for you. Well, it's not, it wasn't for me. It was like, again, like, well, you said Winnipeg is a great place to, to find your comedic voice. Yeah. But, you know, that mirrors the entire country. Like, it's a, Canada's a great college. It's one of the best comedy colleges in the world. It's produced some of the best people, most funny. Look at you got from John Candy to Russell Peters, and and a hundred things in between. You know, Donald, so, Donald yeah. Uh, just even from my hometown, Martin Short, Eugene Levy. You know, you go up the street, Jim Carrey's from Aldershot. You know, yeah. Mike Myers. You know, all the kids in the hall. Uh, uh, I'm probably forgetting some people on the West Coast, but nobody really pays attention to what they're doing anyway. So. <laughs> and I've always heard, hey, if you're from the East, yeah, and they hate, it's the East Coast, West Coast. I didn't know there was parts of the country that hated the East until I went over there. Oh, you fucking East Coasters. Hebrew, Calgary, or people West hate Toronto. They <laughs> yeah, hate I'm Toronto I'm, with a passion. I'm, yeah. With a passion. Yeah. With a smile on their face. I never, 
I never knew that existed. I was like, I thought Canada was all canoe rides and maple syrup, go down pet deer. And we were all kind of, you know, posers at heart. But when I went over there, I never knew that uh, they had a spite for Toronto. Tor they was, see, Toronto doesn't think about them. Toronto's the center of the universe <laughs> is Toronto. Toronto what it thinks of Toronto. I know. I'm from, yeah. I'm from Hamilton. I hate Toronto. That's not true. Toronto is probably one of my top 10 favorite cities I've ever been to. It's a fun city. Queen Street is slowly evaporating to, to what, uh, a strip mall? But so is Sunset Boulevard yeah. in Hollywood. It changed a you lot. Know, the the building of adjacent of the comedy store in Los Angeles yeah. was the House of Blues. Well, now that it looks like an Apple store with a with a hotel on top of it. So anyway, we're getting old. How old are you now? Thirty eight. I'm thirty six. Yeah, thirty six. Well, you look terrible. So do you, man? So do you. Yeah, but I'm hundred and fifty seven years old. Yeah, but I'm in. The <laughs> Listen. <laughs> retard years, you know? I go by life. You're, you're retard years. years. <laughs> you know, well, I'm old. I'm not just 36. I'm 120. Like, no, no. Retard years. But, but no. You're, you're not a drunk or you don't even smoke cigarettes, do you? No, I just smoke weed. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You're just a, you're just a, you're a tip, you look like a typical stoner from Canada. Eh? Eh? What do you I'll do? take it. Um... I've smoked a lot of weed with you lately, now that I think of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who were the comedy influences? Like, any Canadian comics that influenced you, or just states, or how does it work? Listen, you know, you watch my Comedy Now special that I did in 2000. Uh, yeah. Up until that point, I was pulling from the, uh, the muse of, Jim Carrey was, you know, I saw in Living Color, his appearances on the Arsenio Hall show, uh, various, you know, uh, Canadian talk show. The more I kind of researched this guy, I was like, oh, this guy's 15 years old and he's going through life running with no arms. Like he can't fail. You can't stop that, that, that. And then he, regardless, he's transcended all that and became this brilliant artist yeah. and um, so on and so forth. So I knew Jim wasn't a, I knew that I could uh, use him as a blueprint of like what hard work looks like and uh, dedication and fearlessness and taking risks, trusting yourself, you know, um, really, really pouring yourself pouring yourself into your thing, you know, had to really, it was really, uh, the minute that I did my first show, a branch of my life just kind of just like this old skin just kind of rolled off. And I started to kind of go through a change and, um, everything started to kind of streamline itself. And it was like, okay, this, you're thing, very animated on stage. So you're yeah. very animated on stage and, yeah, and most very of that quick punch on the Jim Carrey, and, and and that was all developed completely out of panic. Panic. I was panicked for years. I'd be fucking panicked, but I'd try and package it and just get it into a way that I could just kind of take a shot. Like, are we gonna we're gonna hit something with this yeah. bomb? How is um Ooh, learning how to enjoy the silence. How did that help? <laughs> I'm, learning, I'm just learning how to do that. I'm just learning how to how to just enjoy it. Don't be upset. It's not even enjoying. Enjoying it is taking okay. on an emotion. Enjoying it can be looked at as arrogant. Like you I'm you know, and that yeah. becomes a lot of people will create these holes for themselves so they look cool and I, they didn't get me, man. You know, that silence. But you buried yourself into that hole and stood in it and, and went like this. And that's fine. You know, we have some of our fans. Look at Dan Dunn, for example. Like, yeah. how, like who could sink more ships in five minutes than Dan? And then come out a fucking hero. By yes. the end of people are like carrying him. Ah, you know, yeah. that, that, that's because Dan's also super authentic. Dan can't mm -hmm. be anything else except no. Dan. He's no real. Matter. Real deal. Mike, first of all, you know when that, his birthday was yesterday, by yeah. the way. Uh, that motherfucker, we, 
we would promote it at the same time. We we were off amateur night. Me and Dan used to work together at the right. beginning. But Dan was losing it. He couldn't handle the pressure. And uh, I learned to revel in it. I had to because I created a, a pedestal for myself and people were kind of trying to kick at it. And uh, I didn't even know that I, I would created something that somebody was interested in enough that they were interested in sabotaging me or what have you. But happy birthday, Dan. He'll outlive all of us. Isn't that the worst part? Yeah, pretty well. It's RV <laughs> Park on fucking Yonge Street, you know? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, and, the, and the most dangerous, like, anyway, wow, man. I remember we were sitting in front of a pizza place with Young and Dundas or something. He's wearing coveralls with no shirt. He looks like Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Okay. Wait, this is oh, uh, yeah. And we're eating pizza and we're fucked up. We just came out of the brass rail and we're sitting there eating big slice pizza. Yeah. And this, this, these guys walk by. And it's Young Street at fucking 2 in the morning on, at, on that corner. How, you know how bad that is. By vapor? At yeah. 2 a.m. Yeah, on a, it's sketchy. 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 And Dan, Dan's sitting there and goes, and I'm like, oh. and the guy goes, what? You fucking faggot. And he goes, Dan throws his pizza down, takes his suspenders off, and he goes, I'll bite your fucking nose off. <laughs> and the guy starts pulling his friend out of the way. Let's go. <laughs> He's Dan, kind of like a Chris Farley personality. Like, He's larger than life. Totally. And that's where you run into that. Those chubby, physical, funny guys are usually cursed for early deaths, you know. Um, being in show business and being yeah. famous probably would have killed Dan. You know what I mean? Unless he had an around-the-clock babysitter. And people have all tried to do parts of that with him and, and elevate him. Because we're all fans of him as a person, regardless yeah. if he had a career in comedy and and what have you, but um, yeah. we all know. I always go, that guy's the funniest man in the room. Always. You think like childhood trauma and like craziness and comedy and stand up go hand in hand? For sure. You I know, know I have my demons and stuff, and then on stage I just transform into like. Of course. Somebody. Look, and I think that's probably why you get giggly when I start terrorizing the audience. Because anybody who's been put down or fucked around with or just high school, it fucks with your psychology. So yeah. when I see you take it to the people, ben, no reason. <laughs> I find your joke that powering. I find that special joke thing you, you yeah, have. No, it's you, empowering. You know that you can go on after me and oh. you're going to have a problem. But then I love going on after you. That was the most fun I ever had. That was the most fun I ever had was going after you. I'm like, yes. I was scared shitless. I'm like, oh, fuck. But like, I had the most fun going after you. And like, yeah, I know. And you know how many, first of all, half of you and your fucking half pussy friends, they won't go on after me. They won't. They're terrified because I'll bury them alive. But because they're freaked out, you got nothing to lose. No. <laughs> <laughs> And you get a chance to shit. You know, like, man. People ask me, does Jason Rouse offend you? I'm like, no. Fuck no. <laughs> you know who fucking offends me? Safe space comics who won't put me on the show. Because oh. they think the art, yeah. Who won't put me on the show. I remember hearing that. Well, it's, a, it's still happening now. People are afraid to put me on. A, I get more laughs at them. That's what I said. Yeah. I have fun. I enjoy myself. And also, they are afraid the audience will feel sorry for me and laugh at me. They feel sorry for me. If they do, that's great. Any laugh is good laughs. I'm realizing that. Any laughs I get is good laughs. I don't care how it is or anything. As a, as a person, first of all, you got to recreate a different language for these people. You're saying comedians in a safe space. These are fucking... Okay. Yeah. 
These are no Compose yourself. These people are fucking losers. Okay, and I wish more. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, from what I was told that you weren't the right kind of retarded for a, sh uh, a safe show. See, because the you're, your jokes, this is what happened. And, and this is the cool part about comedy is your material has eclipsed all of your dispositions. You're just a dirty motherfucker who can't hang out with the nice kids. No. Sorry. No. I hated nice kids growing up. <laughs> all nice kids are assholes. Not to be trusted. No. All the ass, like, all the people who gave me chances in comedy are pretty much outsiders. <laughs> like you, Kyle Lucy, Ben Bankes, Mike Rita, Kenny Robinson, like. First of all, there's no union in comedy. It's all outsiders. And it's all snakes and fucking shit. Because there's no, there's no, uh, no one's liable to any, no one's paying into a, a union or a, there's no complaint box. There's no, it's, it's fucking idiots. It's really much, the, the idiots of, uh, um, all the fucking nobodies that have a smartphone and an idea her now are in comedian groups. And uh, I don't know, you know, somebody said to me, go, if you don't claim your income on your income tax that you do comedy, then you're not really a comedian. You're not comic until the, it's part of your right. tax. I hear you. <laughs> so if you can't make a living off of being the comedian, then what are you, uh, what's your contribution to this other than ostracizing a community that's already fucking ostracized? Like exactly. how marginalized can you, we be? Man. It's like you're 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 pissing in your own face, you fucking assholes. And first of all, you're you. A lot of this is look. First of all, you need this. This is for your fucking. You know. You know. When I go on stage, it's a therapeutic experience, and it's also me telling everybody who doubted me and told me that I. Could not read, I could not write, I could not speak. Fuck you! Like, I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this, like, thank you. And also, like, yeah. Yeah, I, same, same kind of thing that kind of motivated me. Like, I was in, quote, special schools. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. in the late 70s, early 80s, I was in these various education programs called SLD. It was slow learning disability classes. Okay. And because I had dyslexia, I was grouped into every kid from immigrants to kids that have serious abuse at home, uh, uh, learning disabilities, all various ailments. And yeah. not to mention the age groups vary. Yeah. So I had to be a bit of a, and I was always the youngest in the class because I was the most, Barrel. How much fucked up things have you seen in special education? How much, like, I've seen, like, people, like, throw people into, like, cases in special education. I've seen, like, crazy shit. Hey, look at the Catholic Church and the indigenous community. You know, there's the abuse. Yeah. Uh... It just shit rolls downhill, man. And I was lucky. I had some cool teachers that really made impressions on me, but they were far apart from each other. There was 10 years where I wouldn't see a soul, like somebody who just like got me or, or at least could educate me in some manner that uh, uh, the other system wasn't really working at. So I got a lot of history lessons from an auto body teacher at a vocational school who had been in Holland during the second world war. He was yeah. Dutch, old Dutch guy and explaining to me about how the um, Dutch send tulips to Ottawa every year, thanking the Canadians for kicking the Nazis out of Holland. And just things I'd never, yeah. you know, I would, there was no, <clears throat> there was no pressing of any. And I was like, Oh, what's Holland? I never thought of Holland. You listen. You listen, and that's, yeah, like, that's the point that people don't have these days, but you listen, but yeah.
I had I didn't have anything to say. My head had been filled up with so much bullshit and trauma yeah. that uh, I wasn't really. Um, I just started to learn to kind of settle into the shadows a little bit, and uh, not necessarily have to put so much of myself out there and maybe gain something, some sort of insight or life. You know, just as simple. I had fucking. Rogan comes into the green room at Vulcan and I'm listening to him talk shop, explain to what his plan is for Austin. And he, something comes up to people that have hard times with memories is from child traumas. That's why, because it's a fight or flight situation. I never even thought about that, but my memory, unless it's written down, things like that. So these little snippets of, just food for your fucking soul, man. <laughs> yeah. You know. You said that, earlier that you, you're not a comic until you, you can claim on your income tax. How long did it take you before you actually made like real cash in the comedy industry? Well, Look, this is what happened, you know, 96, I did my first show, June of 96. I do my first show, right? I come off stage and I start looking at this as, a, as a, like a plan of an attack, a, a some, set some goals, okay? Number one priority, practice, 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 practice. Okay, stage time, stage yeah. time. Realizing after I'd been living in Vancouver for three years, that Ontario had all the fucking clubs. And you go as far as Montreal and as down as Windsor. But there was okay. like 13, there was a one-nighters in Peterborough. I could see on the map. That this is, and the West Coast was like, you know, one here, one eight-day drive over here. Like, and I was like, oh, shit. And the local comedians weren't really friendly to the, to the it was me and Seth Rogen who were on oh. the mic together. Yeah. So that gives you a little bit of a timeline there. So nice. I quickly realized that I had to go back to the fucking place that I was escaping, which was Hamilton. Yeah. Hamilton was in the middle of all of it. Down to Windsor, up to Ottawa. Hamilton's as best you want to be outside of Toronto, you know. Right. So I moved back November of 96 and just, I was doing, you know, Lucy probably holds the record now, but I was doing like, you know, and there was no real open mic circuit. I was doing 50 spots a month easily. Okay, and, great. Um, so I quickly just repetition. I knew that I wasn't smart enough to do anything, but I knew that if I kept showing up that I was going to start to gain some experience. So I just showed up and showed up and showed up. I wouldn't go away. And then... Um, I used to go sit in the office at Yuck Yucks all day. And it was the old office in oh, Yorkville. And okay. uh, uh, above where the old Yuck Yucks actually used to be, which I think is a hotel now. It's kind of weird to see it. So um, I made it so that they could not ignore me in any way or another. I was showing up at their place of business and squatting in the office. Wait, wait I, they go, what are you doing here? I go, I'm waiting for a job. I think showing up is the most underrated, underrated thought that people have. Man, I went to shows. I went to a show just to see you and out there five seconds and the producer came up me say, hey, you want to do five minutes? I'm like, yeah. So I think showing up and just like having a purpose is, is very important. Most definitely in purpose. Key point. Showing up, a lot of people just want to come up and eat off the cheese plate in the green room. They're not really doing anything there, other than being a hit. But if you got if you got all your weapons under your coat, like the Matrix, you know what I mean? They're like, you're next, and you're like, perfect. 
and you go up and kick that fucking door off the hinge and piss all over the front row and get a standing ovation. They're like, this guy was just, he just came out of the restroom. Yeah, but he's always ready. He's always got a little piece of shit hanging out of his ass. I had to live on the edge. You know, Mike, we like gave me a great advice. He told me no matter you're doing two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, forty minutes, give it your all, you know? Like, give it a hundred percent, no matter how much time people will give you. Just give it all. Well, look at what it's come to now. That be, That is more relevant than ever because now you're doing 60 seconds on Kill Tony. Can you bang in 60 seconds? Not a lot of people. Uh, uh, you know, you. They, it's, I've seen people get standing ovations in 60 seconds of words. And some I, people yeah. get four and a half of nonsense. I would like to think about Kill Tony. Only... You, how awesome is that experience? Seeing a comic with LNS, L. Lou Gehrig's disease, Michael Hair, who the fuck iteration to myself? He got a uh, chance yeah. to kill Tony. How the f how awesome is that? Michael Lear is royalty. I, you know, I'm glad you're a fan. I'm like, I'm a huge fan. He's, dude, I, but look, you know, we both live, he lives down the street from me. Um, beast, beast. There is nobody that uses, he has to use an economy of words. As you know, in your stand up act, everything has to land. It has to land or you're fucked. Now, now, you, now there's this retarded guy on stage opposed to the comedian. Yeah. You, don't have, you have no wiggle room to fuck around. You have to be comfortable with putting everything out there and, and just not really have control of it all the time. Like that. And that's what I like about him. And like, he's said things that only <laughs> he can get away with it. And the same thing, I can say things only I can get away with, right? And that's awesome. Yeah, he's great. Like, uh, he, he, and not to mention uh, on episode 500 at the Paramount Theater, um, I got to sit, like, I've, I've been to so many shows. I'd stopped going over the last few months because I've, I've probably seen 200 pony shows and there's no more better bang for your buck for a stand-up comedy ticket than that show yeah. so um to see guys like hans kim and michael you know uh, uh william come on montgomery yeah. what, a, what an animal funny guy. <laughs> he's great funny guy he's so like, it's awesome that like a lot of people will not give those chances to the people. And Tony Hinchcliffe, out of his love for comedy, gave people chances. And I see a Careers, you know? parallel with a with like Ben Blake is to Tony Hinchcliffe. Sure. Uh, like for my own personal experience. Like, Ben Blankis gave me the opportunity for the last four weeks to host his show. I hosted a show I never hosted before. And the no, host showed up late you, and he gave me the chance. Yeah, you, you, see this is the thing, being dismissed by these safe spaces and stuff. There's anybody who's trying to save you from yourself or the audience to protect each other, think with their own compass, is, is sabotage. They need to be exiled. They need to be out. They need to go. 
Is there a safe space and free speech thing in Texas? Like there isn't Toronto? There's a couple of different scenes. Is the same thing in, in Texas? Or I don't know. I'm, I want to, I'm going to experience it, but you yeah. walk around with fucking guns and you know, there's no like my feelings are hurt shit. They don't fuck around. <laughs> That's good. There's, there's probably some factions that I'm not aware of. Uh, okay. But again, there's literally, honestly, Jared, there's, there's about 50 open mics in, in the city of Austin and about three, maybe four comedy clubs. Okay. In a city. With um, 99, there's no censorship. It's all Fifth Amendment, you know, freedom of speech, um, fuck you, you know, dirty South shit, you know, it's cool. But um, Austin looks like Kensington Market. Really? Yeah, you're going to see a, a lot of sloppy uh, white people here. It's kind of Any horses chasing a guy on a <laughs> motorcycle? I saw that at Kansas in the market. Really? I saw a horse chase a guy on a motorcycle. Was it a horse policeman? Yeah, a horse cop. A cop <laughs> a horse the guy on a, ho- on a motorcycle <laughs> on, on a Kensington. Yeah, in Kansas in the market. So I love that place. They That's my the- home. It's my happy place. They use the horses to... Uh- Um, downtown Austin at night is like a fiasco of trunks. It looks like Caravana for white people. We're, we're outie shit, right? Yeah. People get so shot. Like, yeah. People get shot. Is everyone armed in Texas? Are most people armed? Uh, a lot of people are armed, yeah. But it's cool. I don't feel... There's not a lot of arguments. There's not a lot of screaming and yelling because it's like... What's up? And you're you like, feel oh. safe, right? You feel safe, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. all my friends have guns on them. Yeah. And they're they're all ex-military guys and stuff like that. They That's how I felt in Israel. I went to Israel and I keep seeing like people with like soldiers just like with yeah. guns. I just felt like a safeness, like an internal safeness. Yeah, no one's fucking around when there's a guy who's been shooting matchsticks off of a fucking rat's ass. Yeah, no, that, that's good. Well, because there's clearly uh, conflict. <laughs> I think conflict, when there's conflict, there's the underline of peacefulness when there's conflict. Well, that's like, because the stakes are death. Yeah. Stakes are death. Um, you were talking about Winnipeg being a, a great place to start, but the best you because of the it's a hard place to live. Yeah, it's a hard place to live, and it, and not to mention they're not interested in show business in Winnipeg. One yeah. big concert comes every five years, and people talk about it for ten. It's an underrated place in Canada that people try to avoid because it's cold. You know. Oh uh, yeah. I, I've experienced minus 40, you know, something or another. It's tough, but you're good to, good to decide what, where you gotta, what climate works best for your body, too. You know, some people just have allergies. I, I'm sure you've got a laundry list of fucking things that you eat or weather conditions that just fuck up your sinuses or respiratory problems. I feel so much better in the heat. That I do in the cold. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like crippled just, by it. I just feel like also I have like arthritis and stuff. And the gloominess of Canada F's with my system. So, but yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. But, I, I hated like, uh, when I moved to California, I could, I was breathing better. I felt this oxygen move through my body because it was just dry heat all the time. And I wasn't, I was on planes. Oh, I was yeah. in different climates, different drinking water. You also came from England, right? You also came from England. 
which is like look, Kumi just plays in the whole world, right? Yeah, it's always gloomy. It's always uh, like I don't um, know. Like I had Finns visiting me from Canada, and I told them, I go, look at, don't expect a good summer here in London, England. Um, we're gonna have some nice days, but it's gonna be rainy for a bunch. The whole time they were there, it was like 35 every day. I was like, it's never like this. Yes. But that's why I like traveling. I like being, having to adjust and figure out what the lay of the land is. Do you have an advantage on stage? Cause you toured so many places and you see so many different audience. Is it an advantage, right? It's a, it helps you, right? Or it helps me. Kind of help. Look, you know, like we were talking about with Dan Dunn, wherever you put Dan, you could put him in front of anywhere in the world. And his, as long as they speak English, he's going to be able to connect in some way or another. So that's, I don't know why I'm using Dan Dunn. Is, that, is he dead? I'm obsessed. Oh, yeah. I just saw him a couple weeks oh, okay. ago. Yeah, he's good. He's alive. Good, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, especially when you've been to a country a few times or lived in a foreign country a bunch of times, you start to pick up on some of the, you know, um, nuances of things that you can localize and stuff like that. But I found that uh, I didn't want an act that uh, that had a shelf life per se. I wanted something that would, I learned, I had to learn. I couldn't talk about the subway or the Toronto news or, you know, very localized references. I quickly realized, oh, I can need to dump all this and make something that's going to work and blowing, sucking my dad's dick. It's universal. No one wants to see that. So, and like, you kind of make taboo subjects comfortable. Yeah, to the creeps. That I find out who the weirdos are. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have a joke about fucking an older lady or no. the same? See people react to that joke. Some people love it, and some people are like, "Holy oh, shit! What did I just see?" And like, it's awesome to see that you don't shy away from the uncomfortable. I like, no, oh, because I know that face it. technically I've turned the audience against each other. Now, now they're in moral conflict amongst themselves. I'm just the facilitator. I'm the a delivery device. But they've turned on themselves. They know that I don't care. They know there's no hey, fuck you. You know, you get a bit of that or on the internet. But there's no like stop the show. You know, pull the plug out. We can't have this. You know. Yeah. So they turn on themselves, and you'll see guys or people together as a group, and you'll see like the friend go. And they're like, oh, my God, this is so terrible. I can't stop laughing. <laughs> and then someone who's completely uh, split decision. I've I seen people, like, so upset about you after the show. <laughs> they're like, you kind of like, oh, I just, like, I see people upset. And then, and then they sh Hear other comics' names during your set. Like, I've seen that happen, and like, <laughs> I never seen it before. Like, what the fuck? Like, it was, it, it's, it's, it like, you embrace that. Uh, like, that kind of makes you happy, right? Or like, that's what it seems. It's how you know. I'm just throwing airplane, paper airplanes out the window. Mm. Where they land, that's where the wind's going to take it. Yeah. Um, it's a comedy show, man. It's a fucking comedy but show. You think people forgot 
how to laugh. No, but you know, from just, you know, what this is what you get when you repress. You know, you've been repressed, you've been fucked with, and now you're like, no, I'm going to be fucking awesome. And you can either be in the safe space or you can be fucking awesome. Do you want to be a safe space? Wife doesn't have a fucking safe space. Man. No, 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 it. No, I. Um, you, they're doing you. You th- by being alienated by your so-called group that's supposed to look out for you. They're all wolf yeah. in sheep's clothing. I think facing scary situations and like hardcore situations had made me funny. It kind of like bought that thing. Like oh. I thought, like, it's therapeutic. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. It yeah. happened. I can handle it. It's the same thing. I didn't really, I don't really take COVID seriously. Because I went through hard shit growing up. And like, oh, I can't see you. I can't do this. I don't care. Yeah. I still eat it half the time anyways before COVID. So, like, that wasn't a big deal. Yeah, you were living you were living the life of a chubby goth chick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I love your analogy. Yeah, you go it. But yeah, you, that's why I looked at it. You know, my mother even said this. She goes, You've been built for this stuff, you know. Uh, um like I said, like I knew there was gonna be some sort of backswing. I had I, I had some sort of ang I had, yeah. you know. I don't know if it was... Are you a conspiracy theorist? Like, are you into conspiracies? Into, like, thinking beyond what you see on the news and stuff? Sure. Look, you'd be a fool not to think that there's... Everything's corrupt. You know, human nature is a... Um, it's very corrupt. You know what I mean? If you looked at it pr- from the perspective of the planet we would be a fungus, you know, a cancer. Um, so it kind of goes up from there, but I don't know how deep you're, you're thinking here, like space travel, aliens, uh, governments. New uh, world order. New world order, NWO, sure. NWO, but, but I never, government shit's happening soon. Like, that's fine. you can't I, do this, you can't do that. Just control. I made because of being isolated and ostracized, I never believed in the system anyway. From an early age, I had no political, I was consistently let down. Right. You know, so I realized that uh, no one was coming to pick me up and um, that um, I would have to kind of carve my own world out for myself. And um, so when everything fell apart, I, was, I, I wasn't invited anyway. You know what I mean? You just show up, right? You just show up. Show up. I'm just like, okay, everything's on fire. Are we putting this one out or are we adding gasoline? That's all I wanted to know. And How who's you... me? What, 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 who's, who's getting buckets of water with me? Do I like these people? Do I invest? I was thinking about this today. As I did a run this morning and I was yeah. thinking about a grave, okay? The grave. There's a hole in the ground with right. a stone with your fucking name on it. Okay? And you're in front of your death until you die. You're always a second from death. Regardless cosmically on how that's going to manifest itself. Um, we don't know. Now, you got a chance to hold hands with a, a chain of people who's keeping you from killing yourself or putting yourself in harm. Yeah. Where is your chain? How strong is your chain? These are the people that I connect with along my life. And I want to make sure that the line is strong and the people that I really care about and really want to be with. And some of them might be family. Some of them might be friends. Some people are temporary people, you know, in the sense of there's so many people coming in out of your life. Why not hold hands with the people that you want to keep you from your demise? I find that the people I chose in my life have a strong connection to, like, let's say, family and stuff. 
Yeah. How do you feel? Unity, loyalty. Uh, uh, you know, they might have come about these values at different points in their lives, but you know, that's why I found that I hung out with a lot of the Latino comics because they kind of had a cool Canadian-ness about them and they were very family oriented. I they always like my cousin this, my brother that. These yeah. are like, you know, it had a, a thing there. There was and when they do their shows independently from the comedy circuit because they were Latino comedians. Yeah. They would have 500 people at a fucking sports bar. Very family oriented. Yeah, yeah, they're there with their wives and stuff. So I found that those people that either had been in prison or uh, in the military, I found that they were more consistent in what they were saying. Awesome. Speaking about family, was your family supportive in your comedy journey yeah. or? No, I grew up with, my family was all like steel workers in Hamilton, okay. you know. There was nobody in the arts in my yeah. family. My uncle, he was an actor for a period of time in Canada. Um, and um, that was about as extent of it. And all I heard was from him is, about him was, was he was a fag because he was an actor. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, I was like, well, I don't want to be a fag because, you know, I'll be, uh, I'll be pushed out of the family. And then realized that he had, uh, was just a creative person. And um, that wasn't really welcomed to the family. And I, they, yeah. look, at, a lot of these people have never left the city they grew up in. I couldn't expect them to understand that I wanted to be the next Jim Carrey, per se, you know. Yeah. So, no, I didn't. I hid it from them for years. And then I started yeah. to get on television. and I won some awards and whatnot. They yeah. more or less... Uh, yeah. apologized to me. They threw a party. <laughs> and said, My no, family's no. not supportive of me doing comedy. And I kind of take that as fuel. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll yeah, because they think you're embarrassing yourself. That's what they think. And they're wrong. Yeah, You're elevating yourself. Oh, yeah. You know what it's like to take a torch to 100, 300 people. Yes. Can you imagine doing what you've okay. done yeah. in front of 10,000 people yeah. for half an hour? Dude. I'm also having no shame that my family has shame, right? Like all my family like are afraid. I have no shame. Like I'll just take it by try on fire, you know? Yeah. That's how Try I on my life. fire. Try on fire. <laughs> yeah. You don't have a choice. And you don't have any kids, do you? No. No. Yeah. You're fine. Thankfully, but I don't, I'm scared that my child will be more fucked up than I am. And yeah. I know how hard it is. But I'm like that too. Stuff like that. I don't want my, like, I'm afraid that my child will be fucked up or like. Like athlete's foot or something? Athlete's foot, Down syndrome, whoa. <laughs> Whatever, man. Whatever. Like, I'm just like, I, I, it's hard I don't know. I don't want my kid to have yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. the struggle is, right? Yeah, but you know, look, look at what's happened to you. You you seem to be reveling in your life, regardless of your stigmatisms. Yeah. So maybe you're doing yourself a disservice by not having a child that might be even better. But the odds are you're right. Your kid's going to suck. And I don't want to bring him up in this environment now. It's just all this all. <laughs> All this shit. What just happened? Hello. Yeah, we're here. Technical difficulties, but we're here. Amazing. We have a couple minutes left before Zoom kicks me out. Um, how is acting different than doing stand up? Do you have fun doing spare parts? No. <laughs> it was a constant anxiety. Uh, you know, as a comedian, you know, you get into your own boat. It's your boat. You're, no one's on stage with you. You're kind of move, navigating this, this thing by yourself. But then, have you ever been to a circus? Yeah. Yeah, where you, that's, it's like being part of a circus for a duration of time. Okay. So I don't want to be in the circus. I want to be the ringleader. 
You know what I mean? And uh, when you're on someone else's circus uh, and you you have to execute comedic like performances in within someone else's rule book, which is the script, uh, and uh, not having a seasoned background in acting, it was it was hard. It was a, probably the hardest thing I've done, and I I, I would do it again. I'm I'm actually uh, I think I'm doing an, another short film in um, March. Awesome. But uh, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. I'm, like I said, the dyslexia and the ADD, it was very difficult for me to kind of get this stuff. And then I'd have lines where I'd completely nail it. And the director yeah. was like, we need more of that. And I'd be like, but fuck, I have to do it again now? Yeah. And, 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 you know, and stand here, yeah. turn your head, bend this, do that, say it like that, do that 15 times. You probably don't have to sing so much how you're on stage doing comedy anymore. Sorry? Right? You don't really have to think about being on stage doing comedy anymore. It's just like, is it more natural? And like, I... On stage, you have to navigate the drowning sensation. And, and you kind of have to just go through the fire. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You have to go through the fire and just like learn how to tread water, so to speak, while yeah. under so fire. That's where the acting is. It's like you're running through the fire, but you've got two people's kids on your shoulders and they're saying, don't drop them. And you're like, I don't even want them. <laughs> I've, you gotta, you got to be invested in it to the extreme of running babies out of a fiery house. But... It's different. It's completely different. And when you're somebody who doesn't really have any respect for authority or, or rules, and you have uh, rules and authority, um, fortunately, my friend was the director of the movie. So, okay. Uh, I had luxuries that most actors would have been fired in, in most cases for a few short reasons, mainly be having difficulty on some of the days where uh, it was very emotional and in the constant loop, and it was uh, exhausting. And not to mention, you know, you go to the club, you leave the house at seven, grab a bite, yeah. go to the show, do the show, put it, maybe do another guest spot somewhere else, and then that's it. That's like a, you're literally active for a few hours. Say hello, kiss a yeah. baby, shake some hands. Yeah. But in the movie, when you're standing around looking at each other, and there's five hours of di- downtime. Yeah. And then you're busy for 20 minutes, and then six hours of yeah. it, it becomes a, a bit of a whirlwind. Were the other actors scared of you? Were all the actors like scared of Jason Rose? Yeah, but they, they, the director, again, my friend, uh, after the fact, when we finished the movie, Andrew had a meeting with everybody and explained to them that uh, I was um, had rabies more or less, and that uh, I wasn't an actor by trade, right. and that I was a, this comedian that was pretty outrageous, but they were all very professional, and I knew that if I showed up on time and acted professional and worked at it, that it would all come together. But yeah, I was terrified them the whole time, for sure. Yeah, they were scared. Awesome. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk to myself this afternoon is awesome talking to you anything any last words or shout outs or anything you want to do it would cool if i put a gun under my chin and blew the back of my head off does it give me ratings that would give me fucking ratings man uh december 15th my stand-up special is coming out amazing that's about it. Then there'll be a big tour next year. Uh, I think what's going to happen is April and May of next year will be my 60-day Canadian tour. I'll work my way across the country and then go into Europe in June and July. Amazing. That will materialize. But again, you know, we got uh, some big things in the comedy industry happening right here in Austin. So I'm going to spend the next, what are we in now, October, November, December, June. Yeah, so the next four or five months of just enjoying my time here in Austin, Texas and doing comedy. Amazing.
Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Check me out. Uh, go to jasonrouse.com. You can find my podcast, which is Jason Rouse's Safe Word. And, awesome podcast. Uh, dates coming soon for stuff. Thanks for having me on the show. We'll talk soon. Yeah, sounds good. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.